Enki was preoccupied with a new effort. He imagined civilizing humankind. Allow them to look after the agricultural grains they planted and the sheep they raised from ewes. Enki had an idea for a new project, but needed the knowledge to execute it. The necessary Abzu employees for this plan were identified. The residents of Edin, the towns and the orchards were among those he considered. What attributes of the assignments make them suitable? What, the substance of my existence, the substance of my existence has not been merged. Upon observing the offspring of humans, he noticed a troubling reality. Enki's vizier Isimud was inquiring. Isimud talked with Enki. Here is where the boat will paddle. Please kiss the children. Enki walked from the boat Isimud had steered and onto the land. Thus did Enki comment to his vizier Isimud. Isimud sat beside the infants. By the fourth count their bulges were visible. By the end of the ninth count, which had been completed, the tenth count had been completed. The first infant squatted, and a boy was delivered from her. The second child gave birth to a girl while squatting. The two were born at dawn and dusk, which define a day. On the same day as the gracious ones, dawn and dusk, afterward they were referred to in legends. Enki's two sons from the Edin were born in the 90th year of the Shah. Isimud and Enki's births were soon publicized. Enki was happy with the births. Whoever has ever experienced such a thing? The Anunnaki and the Earthling, the educated man I produced, were pregnant. My act must remain a secret, he informed his vizier Isimud Enki. The newborns were breastfed and raised by their mothers until Isimud took them to Enki's home in Eridu. Ninki took an interest in the orphans and raised them like his own children. I spotted them in reed baskets amid the bulrushes. Everyone agrees that Isimud performed similarly. She named the boy Adapa, the foundling, and the girl Titi, one with life. Unlike all the other terrestrial children before them, this pair grew up more slowly than humans, but they understood much more quickly. Because of their intelligence, they could speak with words. The girl was beautiful and kind, and her hands were very talented. Ninki, Enki's husband, and Titi acquired a fondness for all the crafts she taught. Adapa Enki's training taught him how to keep records. Enki and Isimud display delight at their accomplishments. I delivered a civilized man. He told Isimud that his seed created a new kind of earthling in his image and likeness. From now on, the Anunnaki and humanity will be well fed. Enki relayed a message to his brother Enlil, who journeyed from Nibru Ki to Eridu. A new type of person has evolved in the wild. Enki was chatting with Enlil. They may be taught knowledge and skills, since they are rapid learners. Let's send seeds from Nibiru and sheep from Nibiru to Earth and teach the next generation of Earthlings about farming and shepherding. Let's satisfy both the Anunnaki and the Earthlings. They are akin to us in many ways. Enki then elaborated on Enlil. This was told by Enlil to his brother. What a wonder it is that they sprouted independently in the desert. Isimud was requested. He said, I found them amid the bulrushes in reed baskets. Enlil pondered the topic intently, and his head shook in astonishment. Indeed, the evolution of a new species of earthling is a marvel of miracles. The planet itself has given birth to a cultured man who can be taught farming, shepherding, crafts, and toolmaking. Therefore, Enlil, explained Enki, let us, the new species, speak with Anu. Send seeds that can be planted and ewes that can become sheep to earth. The word about the new breed was sent to Anu on Nibiru. Enki and Enlil both proposed the same thing to Anu. Let cultured men appease the Anunnaki and earthlings. Immediately upon hearing the words, he was stunned. 
it is not unheard of for one kind of licence to lead to another. He responded with a message. Unprecedentedly, a cultured Adamu man has arrived on earth. Planting and farming require a lot of people, and people who keep having babies can't do these things. Titi gave birth to twins and two brothers on Eridu as authorities on Nibiru pondered the issue. There was a gap between conception and birth. Adapa knew that his sperm had entered Titi's womb during their encounter. The word of Anu's birth on Nibiru has been communicated. Because the couple is compatible for reproduction, they can procreate. Let seeds and ewes that will become sheep be brought to the earth, and let farming and shepherding begin on the planet. Let us all be satisfied. Enki and Enlil thus told Anu about Nibiru. Permit Titi to stay in Eridu to nurse and care for the babies. Send Adapa the terrestrial to Nibiru. So did Anu share his decision. A Summary of the Adapa Nibiru Tablet Adapa's vast knowledge astounds the geniuses of Nibiru. Adapa is brought to Nibiru at the direction of Anu. Enki reveals the truth about Adapa's parenting of Anu during the very first human space journey. Enki justifies his behavior by claiming he needs more food. Adapa is sent back to resume cultivating and shepherding. Enlil, after Enki, develops agricultural seeds and sheep lines. Ninurta instructs Ka-in in crop growing. Marduk instructs Abel in shepherding and tool making. After a fight over water, Ka-in kills Abel. He is tried for murder and condemned to exile. There are further descendants of Adapa and Titi who intermarry. On his deathbed, Adapa blesses his son Sati as his successor. Marduk brings Enkime, a descendant, to Lamu. Adapa, a native of Earth, must be taken to Nibiru. Did Anu Den agree? Enlil was against the decision. So did Anu share his decision? Who would have guessed that a crude laborer like us would provide the creature with intelligence and allow it to travel between heaven and earth? Enlil was unhappy with the conclusion. On Nibiru, he will drink the water of long life and eat the food of long life, becoming an Anunnaki like us. This was what Enlil stated to Enki and the other chiefs. The dejected look on Enki's face after Anu finished speaking indicated that he disapproved of Anu's decision. Indeed, who among us would have thought? Thus Enki informed the others. The brothers, including Ninmar, sat and debated. The command of Anu cannot be avoided. She persuaded them, Let our children take Adapa to Nibiru so he can get over his fear and explain the situation to Anu. According to the reports of the others, Enki acted similarly. Let his pals Ningish Zida and Dumuzi live. It is through their eyes that Nibiru will be glimpsed for the first time. Ninmar's idea that Nibiru's life cycles are being overlooked while those of Earth are being suffocated was favored. Let the two unmarried sons of Enki also go to Nibiru. Maybe they'll find spouses there. Ilabrat, a vizier of Anu, got off the ship when the next celestial chamber from Nibiru arrived at Sipa. I've come to fetch Adapa an earthling. As a result, he informed the chiefs that Enki's sons, Ilabrat, Ningizida, and Demuzi had arrived. Titi and her sons, together with the chiefs of Ilabrat Adapa, also showed themselves. Indeed, they were fashioned in our image and likeness. Therefore, what did Ilabrat say? They have been chosen as Adapa's traveling companions. Enki also said that Anu's grandkids would be delighted to meet him. Therefore, what did Ilabrat say? He was called by Enki Adapa to receive instructions. You will journey to Nibiru, the planet from whence we sprang. You will stand before Anu, our ruler. You will be introduced to his majesty, and you will genuflect before him. Only speak when questions are posed. 
Please give succinct responses. You will be presented with brand new attire. On earth, they will not offer you a loaf of bread. Food is dead. Do not ingest it. They will offer you an elixir to sip from a chalice. The elixir is death, so do not swallow it. Ningish Zida and Dumuzi, my sons, will journey with you. Their words will be heard, and you will live. Enki Adapa gave the order. I will always remember this, Adapa stated. Dumuzi and Enki Ningish Zida were summoned for his blessing and guidance. Before Anu the king, my father, whom you are approaching, you must genuflect and show him respect. You are on the same footing with princes and nobles. Do not be frightened. Your mission is to return Adapa to earth. Resist Nibiru's allure. This will be remembered, Ningish Zida and Dumuzi stated. His little kid, Dumuzi, hugged and kissed his father on the forehead. Sage Ningish Zida hugged him and gave him a forehead kiss. Unseen, he put a sealed tablet in Ningish Zida's palm and said, My father, Anu, please deliver this tablet in secret. Enki informed Ningish Zida of the same. Adapa and Sipa joined the three as they traveled to the place of celestial chariots. The three of them each carried Ilabrat, Anu's vizier, wherever they traveled. Ningish Zida and Dumuzi were dressed as heavenly eagles after receiving the clothing of Igigi. Adapa was positioned between Ningish Zida and Dumuzi inside that which ascends. His wild hair was shaved, and he was given headgear like an eagle. In place of his loincloth, he was forced to don a snug vestment. When the signal was received, the heavenly chariot roared and shook. Adapa was terrified and cried, The eagle without wings is flying. Ningish Zida and Dumuzi helped him feel better by putting their arms around him and saying soothing things. When they reached a height of one league, they glanced upon the earth and noticed that its regions were separated by seas and oceans. Two leagues above sea level caused the ocean to shrink to the size of a bathtub. The property was about the size of a basket. When they were three leagues above the earth, they turned around to see their origin. A vast darkness had now engulfed the earth, which was now a tiny sphere. Adapa was upset again. He cowered and pleaded. Take me back, he shouted. Ningish Zida put his hand on Adapa's neck, at which point Adapa fell instantaneously quiet. When Nibiru arrived, there was much interest. Enki's descendants on Earth will see much more, so an Earthling will hear. An extraterrestrial has landed on Nibiru. Similarly, the populace yelled. When Ilabrat transported them to the palace, Aromatic oils were used to cleanse and anoint them. In response to Enki's comments, they were given new fitting apparel. Adapa wore the new gear. The palace was full of nobles and heroes, and princes and advisors were meeting in the royal chamber. Adapa and the two sons of Enki followed Ilabrat into the royal chamber. They bowed in the royal chamber before King Anu. Anu rose from his seat and advanced. My grandkids, he yelled at his grandchildren. He hugged and kissed the Muzi and Nigisida, whom he had just embraced with tears in his eyes. The Muzi wanted to be placed on the right side of Nigisida, who sat on the left. Then expand on Anu's, the earthling Adapa's presentation. Anu, the king of Ilabrat, inquired, Does our communication make sense? Indeed he does. He was trained by Enki. Praise God, Ilabrat responded accordingly. Come inside, Anu told Adapa. What is your complete name and profession? Adapa came forward and bowed again, saying, My name is Adapa, and I am Lord Enki's servant. This is how Adapa vocally expressed himself. His impressive fluency was astonishing. The summit of planetary wonders has been attained, Anu declared. The summit of planetary wonders has been attained, everyone in attendance screamed. Let there be a party, and let's greet our visitors this way, 
Anu was saying. He pointed energetically to the banquet room. Anu guided the gathered party to the occupied tables. Nibiru Adapa was given bread at a table laden with food, but he declined. Nibiru Adapa's elixir was given at the ladle tables, but he did not drink it. Anu was shocked and angry that Enki, a crook from earth, had told him about the ways of heaven. Come swiftly, Adapa. Why, Adapa wonders. Anu, did you deny our hospitality by refusing to eat or drink? My lord, Lord Enki commanded, the bread does not eat and the elixir does not drink. Likewise, Adapa, King Anu, reacted. Anu was saying, How strange is this? Why has Enki prohibited earthlings from eating our food and drinking our elixir? Ilabrat did not know the solution, and Dumuzi could not provide an explanation. Ningish Zida to Anu The monarch Anu was unaware of the personal tablet he carried. He interrogated Ningish Zida. The solution may be here. Then he donated. Concerned and bewildered, Anu retreated to his private room to understand the tablet. This is the narrative of Adapa, the creator of civilized humanity, and how his sons Cain and Abel introduced satisfaction to the planet. In Anu's private room, the tablet's seal was broken. He placed the tablet into the scanner to decode Enki's message. Adapa was born to a lady from Earth with my seed. Enki mentioned this in his message. Titi was also created by another Earthling lady using my sperm. They possess intelligence and language, but need to maintain the longevity of Nibiru's inhabitants. Neither the longevity bread nor the longevity elixir should be ingested. Adapa must return to Earth to live and die. He must accept his mortal destiny. Satisfaction will be attained via the procreation and care of his offspring on Earth. Anu was informed of the truth about Adapa by Enki. Enki's hidden message left Anu speechless. He did not know whether to be furious or to laugh. Ilabrat called his vizier to a private room and told him, My son Ea is as promiscuous with women as Enki. He provided Ilabrat with the tablet containing the message. Anu questioned his vizier. How should the king behave, and what are the rules? Our laws are now for concubines, but there are no laws regarding interplanetary cohabitation. So said Ilabrat to the king. Damage must be limited, and Adapa must be returned to earth without delay. Please lengthen the stay of Ningish Zida and Dumuzi. Anu then escorted Ningish Zida to his private room and called for a servant. Do you know what your father's message contained? What questions did he have concerning Ningish Zida's message? He interrogated Ningish Zida. Ningish Zida said it in a whisper with his head lowered. I do not know, but I can. I have analyzed the essential essence of Adapa Enki's seed. That is the message indeed. Anu informed him that Adapa would return to Earth immediately and that his destiny would be to start a civilization. You, Ningish Zida, will go back to Earth with Adapa to teach people how to be civilized with your father. Similarly, Anu, the king and decision maker, decided the destiny of Adapa and Ningish Zida. Anu and the two others returned before the servants, nobles, princes, and counselors. Anu declared in a resolution to the assembly that the reception of earthlings must not be excessive. On our planet he can't eat or drink. We've all seen how amazing he is, so let him come back to earth. Let his children work the fields and take care of the meadows. Ningish Zida will go with him to make sure he is safe and to keep him from worrying. He will bring the Nibiru grain seeds that grow well on earth. Dumuzi, the youngest, will stay with us in exchange for a shah. He will then go back to earth with ewes and sheep essence. This was Anu's decision, and he nodded in agreement as he listened to the king's speech. At the right time, Ningish Zida and Adapa were carried to the place of the celestial chariots. 
Arno and de Musi, the Ilabrat and their counselors, bid the nobles and warriors goodbye. They could see from the horizon to the highest point in the sky. As the chariot climbed into the air, there was rumbling and shaking. The size of the planet Nibiru shrank. As they journeyed from Ningish Zida to Adapa, the planet gods explained. He taught him about the sun, the earth, and the moon, as well as the progression of the months and the calculation of the earth's year. The daytime sky on earth grows darker. At night, a spell of darkness was cast onto the surface of the moon. Lahamu was screaming for help from her celestial brethren, demanding to know, Whom will the dragon hinder? Who is going to stop and remove it? She was curious. Only the valiant Kingu, who had previously defeated Tiamat, answered. Kingu moves quickly to intercept the dragon en route. During the fierce fight, a cloud storm poured onto Kingu. The moon shook and trembled due to the impact on the foundations of Kingu. The cosmic chaos eventually subsided. Lahamu was not abandoned when Nibiru returned to its home in the Great Depths. After the stone projectiles impacted the ground, the rain stopped falling in Lamu. Enki and Enlil gathered with Marduk and Ninurta to see the devastation they had caused. Enki researched the status of the Earth's foundations and platforms. In the furthest reaches of the world, he measured the depths of the seas and scanned the mountains of gold and copper. There will be a great deal of vital gold. Enki mentioned this. Ninurta was the surveyor of the Edin. Wherever mountains and valleys trembled, he flew and went in his airship. The landing pad was intact, and molten planet fluids flowed into the northern valleys. As Marduk explained to Enki, the environment in Lamu had worsened, and dust storms had become a nuisance to everyday life. Consequently, Ninurta informed his father Enlil of his finding of sulfuric mists and bitumen. He expressed to his father his wish to return to Earth. Enlil reverted to his earlier plans and re-evaluated his envisioned cities and duties. In Edinburgh, a chariot track must be erected. On the crystal tablet, he exhibited the initial layout designs for the others. The mode of transportation from the landing location to the way station on Lamu remains to be discovered. We must be capable of reaching Nibiru from Earth. Enlil treated every one of them equally. Establish the place of the chariots next to Bab Tibira, the metal city, and carry the gold straight from Earth to Nibiru. Since the original hit, eighty shahs have appeared. Thus spoke Ninurta, the leader of Bab Tibira, to them. This explains Enki and Marduk's trip to the moon and Enki's finding of the three pathways to heaven and the stars. Enlil listened carefully to Ninurta's remarks. He was pleased with his son's wisdom. King Enlil relayed his words to Anu. Establish a place of celestial chariots in Edin and construct it where gold ore is refined. Let the chariots carrying pure gold go straight from Earth to Nibiru, while the heroes and supplies journey the other way. Hanu, the father, was discussing Enki. My brother has a brilliant plan. The net gravitational attraction of Earth is far more potent than that of Lamu. We will need all of our might to overcome it. Before hastily reaching a decision, let's explore other choices. The moon is the companion of the earth. Its net, pull, ascent, and fall are all modest, requiring little effort. Permit Marduk and me to go on our adventure. Consider the location a stopover. Let's begin by exploring the moon. King Arnu presented advisors and geniuses with two proposals for consideration. They did provide guidance to the king. Let's begin by exploring the moon. The decision was communicated by Anu to Enki and Enlil. Enki was overjoyed. The moon had always fascinated him. He enjoyed contemplating whether it was lurking in the ocean and what its habitat was like. Over the course of several sleepless nights, he was captivated by the bright silver disk. 
He felt that the sun was engaging in a game of waxing and waning, which was a phenomenon of incredible proportions. The mysteries it had hidden since its creation interested him. Enki and Marduk traveled to the moon on a rocket ship. They encircled the Earth's ally three times while examining the dragon's horrific wound. The moon's surface was scarred with craters, resulting in the devil's destruction. They successfully landed the rocket ship among undulating hills. From Earth, they were able to observe the expanse of the sky. They navigated in all directions with ease. They were compelled to don eagles' helmets due to the lack of oxygen in the air. The terrible dragon brought about desolation and aridity. Unlike Lamu, it is improper for me to stop. Marduk was. Let's abandon this region and return to Earth. My child, do not behave in a hurry. Enki therefore explained this to Marduk. Are you fascinated by the cosmic dance of the Earth, Moon, and Sun? From this vantage point, the view of the closest quarter of the Sun is uninterrupted, and the Earth seems to be a globe in the void with nothing hanging. We can inspect the far heavens using modern technology. In this solitude, we can enjoy the work of the All Creator. Let us stay. The circuits will watch the orbit of the Moon around the Earth and the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Enki, angered by the sight of his son Marduk, listened to what he had to say. The words of Marduk's father convinced him to board the rocket ship, and they did so. They waited for one rotation of the Earth and three rotations of the Moon, at which point they tallied the Moon's revolutions around the Earth and calculated its month-long duration. The duration of the Earth's year was calculated using six orbits around the planet and twelve orbits around the Sun. They documented how the two were connected, which led to the appearance of the luminaries. Then they headed to the Sun section and focused on Mumu and Lahamu's researched paths. Lamu, the second Sumerian quarter, began to form in conjunction with the Earth and Moon. There were six celestials in the lower waters. Enki therefore explained this to Marduk. Anshar and Kishar, Anu and Nudimud, Gaga and Nibiru were the six celestials of the upper waters, beyond the bar and the hammered bracelet. There were twelve, including the sun and its immediate family. Marduk questioned his father over the recent upheavals. Why have seven consecutive celestials had their places usurped? His father questioned. So was he? Then their sun Enki revolving circuits were studied. Enki, their progenitor, carefully observed the many rings surrounding the sun. Enki has created a chart depicting the locations of the earth and moon. He drew a broad band whose breadth was determined by Nibiru, the sun, and not by a descendant. Anu, the king, picked Enki as the name for his son. Enki was mesmerized by how close and close together the stars were that he saw with his father in the majesty of the sky that seemed to go on forever. He sketched twelve constellations on the horizon-to-horizon -horizon arc of the sky. He partnered with one of the sun's twelve families in the great band, the Way of Anu. Based on their names, he assigned each individual to a station. Then, under the Way of Anu, from whence Nibiru, the sun, was coming, he constructed the Way of Enki and allocated twelve constellations based on the forms of their stars. The sky was called the Path of Anu, the Upper Tier, and Enlil. From the stars, twelve constellations were constructed. In their three places, there were thirty-six constellations of stars. Also, would the location of the Earth around the Sun be calculated as it traveled? At the beginning of the cosmic time cycle, Enki's letter to Marduk declared, When I arrived on Earth, the station I was leaving, the Station of the Fishes, was named after me. I gave him the water to a follower of my name, Enki, who was overjoyed with his son Marduk, made this observation. The sky welcomes your knowledge, and the reach of your lessons is beyond your grasp. 
On Earth and Nibiru, however, knowledge and authority are distinct. What did Marduk overhear his father say as a result? This is what Enki told him. My kid, my kid, what do you need more information about? What specifically do you lack? I have disclosed the secrets of the heavens and the earth to you. Poor old father, Marduk was saying. His voice conveyed anguish. Ninma Ninurta's mother was called to assist you when the Anunnaki in the Abzu halted working and the primitive worker was assigned to fashion, not my mother. My younger brother, Ningish Zida, not I, was requested to aid you. However, you did not share your perspective on life and death with me. My kid, you deemed Igigi and Lamu's instructions to be superior, Enki addressed Marduk. Poor old father, this was the statement made by Marduk. Unfortunately, we are unlucky. You, my father, are Anu's firstborn, but Enlil is the legal heir. You constructed Endu first. However, Eridu is in Enlil's dominion, while yours is in distant Abzu. I am your oldest child. My mother gave birth to me on Nibiru, yet the gold in Inurta is collected from that spot to convey or withhold it. Nibiru's existence is in his hands, not mine. We are now returning to Earth. What is my responsibility? Am I destined for greatness and reign, or will I again suffer humiliation? Enki cradled his kid in silence as he made a pledge to him on the lonely moon. Whatever I have been deprived of must be your future destiny. Your moment in paradise will come at the same time as mine. This is the story of Sipa, the location of the chariots in the Garden of Eden, and the return of the first workers to Edin. Father and son were away for several Earth cycles. On Earth, no plans were carried out, and on Lamu, the Igigi were in disarray. After hearing his words made confidentially, Enlil expressed concern to Anu. He relayed this via Nibru Ki. Enki and Marduk on the moon have completed many revolutions where they reside. Their acts are a mystery. What they are planning is unknown. The Lamu waystation Marduk has been abandoned, and the Igigi are taken aback. Dust storms have been the most common. What damage has been done to us is unknown at this time. To determine where the chariots are located in Edin. As a consequence, the gold is transported straight from Earth to Nibiru. On Lamu, there will no longer be a need for a waystation. Ninurta's plan and understanding of these issues are great, so have him build the place of chariots near Bud Tibira. Ninurta should serve as the first commander. Anu scrutinized Enlil's remarks before saying, Enki and Marduk are returning to Earth. What have they learned about the moon? Let's hear what they have to say first. Enki and Marduk fell to Earth from the moon. They came back. They evaluated the situation. A way station is now unfeasible. As such, they reported. Let the location of the chariots be built, Anu was saying. Marduk should serve as its commander. Enki was conversing with Anu. Ninurta must abort the mission, Enlil angry roared. Igigi no longer needs the command. Let Marduk be in charge of responsibilities. Let Marduk be in charge of responsibilities requiring his comprehension. Similarly, as Enki's father concerned, Anu studied the situation and concluded, Rivalries have now reached the boys. Did Anu have intelligence? His conduct demonstrates this. Let's see what a new generation receives at the place of the chariots where new gold-handling methods are assigned. Instead of Enlil, Enki, Ninurta, and Marduk, the third generation, under the leadership of Utu, will be in charge. Sipa, the bird city, should be named the place of the celestial chariots. This was Anu's word. The king's word could not be changed. In the 81st Shah, the building started, followed by Enlil's plans. As Enlil had suggested, Nibru-Ki was located in the center or navel of the planet. 
The ancient cities were organized in rings according to their distances and positions. From the lower sea to the mountains, they were arranged like arrows. He drew a line from the twin peaks of Arata to the northern sky, intersecting the pointing arrow of the Arata line. He assigned Sipa the task of locating the chariots on earth. A perfect circle indicated its position concerning Nibru Ki, where the arrow pointed directly. Everyone was astounded by the originality and precision of the concept. The building of Sipa was finished in the 82nd Shah, and its leadership was given to the grandson of Enlil, the hero Utu. With the wings of an eagle adorning his helmet, it was created for him. Anu drove the first chariot from Nibiru to Sipa to see the installations and marvel at his desired achievements. Marduk summoned the Agigi from Lamu to Earth as well as the Abzu Anunnaki for the occasion. Before departing, there were backslaps and shouts, a meal and a celebration, and the heroes and heroines gathered. Anu Mana, the granddaughter of Enlil, was honored with singing and dancing, and she kissed her with love. He lovingly referred to purity as Anunitu. The Golden Redemption reveals that the end of the toil is nigh. As soon as adequate riches for defense have been amassed on Nibiru, work on Earth may be lessened, and heroes and heroines from Nibiru will return. With a few more sharias of labor, they will be tied. King Anu spoke to the gathered people, promising them great hope. Anu planned the return of Nibiru with great splendor. He was bearing pure gold. His new mission, Utu with Cherish, was fulfilled, and Ninurta of Bad Tibira maintained his position as leader. Marduk returned neither to Lamu nor to Abzu with his father. Utu was in charge of the Yagigi, some of whom lived on Lamu and others on Earth. In all, the number of areas he wanted to tour in his skyship and grasp on Earth was in the millions. After Anu and Nibiru's return to Earth, the leaders were optimistic. They expected the Anunnaki with renewed labor motivation. The quick collection of gold facilitates the journey back home. Sadly, the exact reverse happened. The Anunnaki wanted to relax in the Abzu, not work all the time. Now that earthlings are multiplying, let them do the work. According to the Abzu, the Anunnaki existed in this manner. In the Edin, tasks were more complicated, requiring more homes and resources. The heroes of Edin requested that primitive workers be incarcerated by the Abzu. Only Abzu could offer 40 shahs of relief. The heroes of Edin said, Our labor has grown terrible. Give us the laborers too. Ninurta took the initiative as Enlil and Enki discussed the matter. He sent fifty heroes and their respective weapons on an expedition to the Abzu. They followed earthlings across Abzu's forests and steppes. Males and ladies were captured and carried to Edinburgh. They were taught all municipal and orchard duties. Their actions upset Enki, and Enlil was furious. You have undone my expulsion of Adamo and Tiamat. The Abzu revolt, not the Edin revolt, should be reinstated. Therefore, Enlil informed Ninurta. The heroes are at peace now that the earthlings are in Edin. A few more shahs and it won't matter anymore. Following Enlil, Ninurta. Enlil was unsatisfied and muttered, Let it be, to his son. Let the wealth amass quickly, and let us all return to Nibiru as soon as possible. The earthlings, the Anunnaki, valued Edin's intelligence and understanding of commands. They claimed responsibility for all duties. They accomplished tasks in their naked state. Males and females were constantly mating, and reproduction was rapid. Their generations ranged from four to more than ten inside a single shah. As the human population increased, the Anunnaki had more workers, but demanded more food. The people of Earth are always hunting for food in cities, orchards, valleys, and hills. In those days, 
neither a sheep nor a lamb had been formed, nor had grains been gathered. Enlil responded to Enki's harsh words by stating, Your acts created confusion. Let you be the one to provide redemption. This is the story of how man became civilized, how Enki, Adapa, and Titi's secret was revealed in the Eddin. Enki was both happy and worried about how many earthlings there were. The Anunnaki's situation was greatly improved, and their suffering was lessened. Due to their increasing population, the Anunnaki rejected labor, and the workers became serfs. The seven shahs made the Anunnaki's circumstances significantly more hospitable, and their dissatisfaction diminished. What was inadequate for everyone was rendered sufficient by the multiplication of humans. Three further shahs of fish and poultry were necessary to satisfy the Anunnaki and humans. 